My name is Tim Calvaries. I work for a company called Esri. My colleague here, Jim Barry, has got some really good information that's going to teach you how to do spatial analysis. I'm going to talk a little bit about Esri and ArcGIS and some of the things that we do here in the city, and then I'll give uh, Jim a chance to uh, take over and like teach you how you can actually do stuff, right? The stuff that you really want to know. Esri is a 50-year-old software company. Um, let this sink in for a second. Um, there's not a lot of those around, right? Uh, it's also, it's a company that's still run by the guy who started it 50 years ago. So it's not a shareholder thing. Uh, it's a company that's run by a man and his, and uh, a husband and a wife out in California. And, um, and it's spread throughout the world and it's used by lots and lots of governments and agencies and nonprofits around the world doing a lot of stuff. Right. Um, just wanted to kind of set that context up here because we'll, we'll, we'll talk about something a little bit more. So ArcGIS is one of the products that this company called Esri makes. You might've seen it as ESRI. It used to stand for something like Earth Environmental Numbers. Research systems, right? But which was internationalized, that translation doesn't always, that acronym doesn't always work out. So now it's just ESRI. So you can just call it ESRI. Right. Um, and we make a product or a whole suite of products, and one of them is called ArcGIS. People who have gone to, you know, have gone to school and learned this maybe in college. A uh, geographic information system is a system for managing, analyzing, and visualizing spatial data, right? Um, but these systems are big, right? They're, they're systems of record, they're insight, ways to learn things, uh, and not just ways to learn things as the user, but to engage the public so that they can learn what you want to show them, right? What's not in that lesson is how to use the clicker. Okay. Um, we have lots of applications for GIS and all kinds of things. And these are just three that maybe resonate with uh, some of you. Health and human services, equity and social justice is something that we work with a lot, and public engagement and collaborating with the public. And these are examples from around the country of different uh, applications that have been built on, on ArcGIS um, that were talked about in our user conferences and things. One of the, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about though, a little bit more is we work with a lot of New York city, uh, departments, um, or agencies. Uh, these are all examples of current work that's up for with different city agencies, DCLA a percent, uh, for art collection. This is this really cool program where, um, there are art exhibits, uh, the city funds art exhibits all over the city. There's a map and a page, a web page that gives you all the information about each one of those art exhibits, uh, parks and recreation with their tree canopy story maps. The idea of, uh, just having a simple map isn't always enough. You want to have, um, uh, software that includes with it, the web page and the text that explains the map and allows people to interact with it in a guided sort of way. Right. Um, department of finance, the property information portal that was released in January to replace the digital tax map uh, it is a custom built application that is on our ArcGIS platform and it actually allows for the digit the 3D visualization of tax lots and property. Um, we do a lot of work with OTI, formerly known as Doit, uh, to replatform their GIS capabilities. This is an app called uh, Now and Then that allows you to overlay a bunch of different years of aerial imagery, including going back to like 1924. So you can see what used to be there and what's there now. You may have seen it in other applications and this is kind of like a newer, a newer version of it. We do some work with the Department of Education. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because this kind of like represents sort of a, a pattern of collecting data and visualizing data that we, that we use or we see often used by city agencies. This is the school kitchens dashboard. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It was written about it in Chalkbeat, um, I guess about last year. And this was an effort um, uh, 
the Department of Ed wanted people to learn about what goes on in school kitchens, right? And they wanted to show them that these places are really clean, they're really well cared for, and they're really taken care of. So they wanted to collect information about each one of the school's kitchens. Uh, we helped them create a survey using a, a piece of software in our system called Survey123. That allows uh, school kitchen managers to go through and answer a bunch of questions and take pictures with their phone. And it all goes into um, a GIS database that we can then pull and create a dashboard that a manager back in DOE Central can review their data, make sure that everything's right. And when they say, yes, I, I accept this survey, this was done well, then it goes into the public survey that allows the public to be able to see not just all the, and I know it's tiny, you can't see it here, but I invite you to see it on the, uh, you know, the real version. Uh, gives you all kinds of information about that school, about the kitchen in that school, and also the photos of the actual school so you can see it all. But that pattern of creating a survey that's geo-enabled, collecting information from the field and passing it into, um, the, into the platform so that you can create other products from it is a pattern that we see often, often used. I'm going to keep pressing the button that just makes the, the red light. Um, it's, but we don't do just thing, just things for New York City agencies, although that's where my focus is. There's a lot of other examples of work out there. This is a story map about uh, deaf spaces in New York City. It was fascinating. Uh, this was an application that was built. Uh, it's a uh, Manhattan Skyline Explorer. It's a 3D visualization that you click around at each one of the buildings and it highlights information about that building. And then there's this timeline about when buildings were built. So you can kind of see and move through the Manhattan space, seeing when buildings were built and those kind of uh, uh, specific information about them. What we're going to talk about is the many people are familiar with GIS as desktop, desktop software that you've installed on your machine. And that's very powerful and very important for a number of things. We're going to focus on an applic a version of our software that's in the cloud. This is called ArcGIS Online. Customers who acquire ArcGIS Online can create their own organization. So I work for, I do a lot of work with, um, the Office of Technology and Innovation, their instance of ArcGIS Online is they've named it NYC Maps. But it's all part of this whole cloud environment called ArcGIS Online. And that gives uh, access to all kinds of GIS tools and storage and data that other people have created that have, just have shared out on this environment. What this does is it means you always have access to the newest form of the software, the most update form of the software. And you can make use of that without having to continuously update yourself, right? leveraging those cloud capabilities. Some of the other applications of GIS. So we know a lot of people have probably done GIS to uh, analyze data, but what we really want to do is start to use the data to tell stories to create action. So story maps kind of alluded to them before, are a and uh, um, software that is in ArcGIS Online that allows you to create presentations where maps are embedded. The maps are interactive, so you can do everything that you would want to do with an interactive map, but wrapping it around with text and images and stories and guidance that allows people to like extract more information from that from that map. Also, ArcGIS dashboards. Uh, or another mechanism that people can, um, that help organize your data into an interface that allows for better monitoring. We wanted to stress that ArcGIS is a, it's a product, um, but it's also based on open standards, open data, and open science. So we want to support, we support the, um, the fair data principles of findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So there's open APIs. A lot of this is still, and I guess Jim might help describe some of that a little bit. 
anybody can sign up for an ArcGIS developer account for free. Uh, we invite you to do that. I think you're going to show how to do that, right? Uh, so you'll get to see how to do that. And this is going to what the first step to unlocking a lot of these capabilities. So we kind of talked about a, what ArcGIS is. I don't, I would hope what you take away from this is that it's more than just making maps, right? We can talk about mapping, but it's also the 3D modeling, the remote sensing, spatial analysis, data collection, which is just as important, uh, and actually using out in the field on uh, your mobile devices and so on. Uh, and this is a system for making applications, not just maps, for making, for creating data, right? series of developer tools, a host of training, um, the support and the security in the community that comes along with being part of this. Um, with that, is that okay if I go to you? Yeah. All right. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, great. No summary. Um, Ken, uh, my name's Jim Barry. Yes. Of Pope. Uh, my name's Jim Barry. I've been I've been at Esri actually 30 years now. Uh, I worked mainly in. Uh, thank you. I'm waiting to see what they get me. Did I get anything for that? Um, but uh, thank you. Um, and uh, most of it working out at our headquarters. We're actually based in California, but for a number of years I worked here in our New York City office uh, with Tim and, and lots of other folks here, and 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 watching these tools and this software and this 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 application do a lot of good out uh, in the city, not only in amongst city agencies for managing their data as a system of record for analyzing their data so that they can make really good decisions, but then also visualizing that data like on a map and getting that those maps shared out uh, into the field, into the public, where folks can be better informed as to what's going on in the city that they work in. And not just in city agencies, but we work with a lot of uh, nonprofits as well that that serve the community. Uh, Beta NYC is one of those that we uh, matched up with a number of years ago. Civic tech nonprofit that uh, that 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 does a lot of good. So uh, yeah, that is one of the benefits of Esri just still being owned by one guy. Is he's a hippie tree hugger from the '60s, so he is an idealist who just if he wants to do something, he just does it. Um, he doesn't have to ask anyone. I mean, other than his, his wife owns 51% of the company. So I guess he's got a clear, clear, but, uh, yeah. So, so a lot of good things, uh, that you can do with this. Yeah. So rather than concentrating on our heavy software, that stuff costs money. It's real commercial grade, industrial grade stuff. Yeah. We want to kind of talk to you about our SaaS product, our, our more lightweight on online product that you can use for free. Uh, even if you're not a developer, so don't let the word developer spook you at all, because um, it's just I recommend if you're going to use ArcGIS Online for free, get yourself a developer license, even if you're not going to be coding or anything like that, because the developer license gives you access to all of the web applications and mobile applications that you can use on, on our cloud, but also gives you access to a limited amount of what we call location services, like routing services, geocoding, reverse geocoding, some geo enrichment, which means more data that you can add to your data, uh, and then also cloud storage. So you can create data and store it on our cloud and publish it out as web services that you could bring it into web maps. You could do all of that for free to a limited amount. I think it's 200 megabytes per month or something like that. Uh, after that, it's just like any other cloud service. You know, there's a there's a lot that you could do for free. There's a free level, and then you can add to it. But we're, we're not trying to sell anything here. I'm just trying to show you everything you can do uh, for free. And uh, what you want to do, uh, you can just go to developers.rgs.com. And uh, let me head over there. Where's my tab here? Mine's... Oh, I'm here is. Yeah, you can go to developers.artgis.com and there's a button that says start building for free and it lets you um, uh, sign up. 
you can create a new uh, account or you can link it to one of your other social accounts. But I want to draw, kind of draw your attention to this stuff over here. This is all the stuff that you could do for free when it comes to addressing, place locating, lots of base map tiles, places you can store your data. Even if you work for an organization that owns ArcGIS, I also recommend it's a good idea for you to kind of have your own little sandbox area that you can kind of try and test things out. Even if you're a student that has ArcGIS at school, it's good to have that little sandbox account uh, that you could do a lot of stuff with. Um, before before lunch, I was in uh, uh, Martha's. Anyone was in Martha's presentation? That was a great presentation. Uh, she talked about a geocoding service that's available within New York City. Use that one. <laughs> Our geocoding service is a world geocoding service. The, the geo client one in New York City is much better, but you can you can use it, it, it with it. So go ahead and sign up. Uh, and then also, I'm going to leave this up for a moment because when you sign up, you get that free level. But because you're in the room uh, and either in a seat or hanging on the back wall, there's an extra voucher code that you can use that will add more cloud credit and it lights up a, a lot more of these location services that you didn't have before. So after you create the account, then just go to billing and down here it says voucher code. Just enter an NYC SOD, NYC School of Data 2024, click redeem and it'll add $20 more of that cloud credit. That should be enough to kind of mess around with it for a while. Um, that code expires on July 1st. So you got between now and July 1st, but if you don't use it before July 1st and you want another code, just let me know. I'll get you one. Okay. So that's, uh, how to get it. And then what happens when you have it is when you sign in, you go to the developer's website. Again, even if you're not a developer, this is a great place to be, but if you are a developer, uh, here's your dashboard that you can use in order to manage uh, the maps that you create, the applications that you create, the layers of information, what we call you know, your data that you upload, that you publish on the GIS. And then also, if you are a developer, you can create your own API keys. So uh, if, you're create, if you're building a custom application and you, you want to create an API key so that certain types of functions light up for your end users, you can do that with these API keys and you can manage that all here uh, in, in this dashboard. All right. So that's signing up and getting, getting going. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the New York City open data site and how well does New York City open data site work with ArcGIS stuff. It works pretty well. And I'm going to show you some examples of how that can be done. Uh, let me see here. Let's go back here. And uh, so let's, uh, one of my favorite data sets, and if you were in my presentation last year, I touched up on uh, bike paths a little bit. So I'm going to start with bike paths and keep going. If, if you didn't see it, then we're starting new. So you're on the open data site. I'm, uh, let me see. Let me make sure I'm signed in so that the stuff that I do is um, kind of recorded. All right. So I'm going to search for bike routes. And uh, when I do that, I'll find uh, a data set here. Um, and, you know, thank goodness for that 2012 open data law. I've worked in GIS in lots of different cities and states in this country, and none, not many of them are as advanced as New York City when it comes to, you know, now 12 years, all your agencies uh, are required to share that data with you. That's just a goldmine when you're doing this type of GIS stuff. So if I click on bike routes, it'll give me um, a... a um, It'll give me a kind of a preview, quick preview of what that data set looks like. And then it gives me the ability to um, export that data. Uh, Martha showed a little bit about that SODA API or the S SOQL. Uh, I'm going to get into that a, a little bit uh, to show for you developers how you can use that. But for now, I'm just going to kind of keep it um, uh, simple and we'll just get to peel the onion one layer at a time. And you've got a variety of different formats. Some of these you may be familiar with, even if you're not a GIS type person, CSV, uh, Excel, that kind of thing. But then you have these other data formats that are very popular amongst uh, government data portals that you see very often. 
are KML and KMZ, which are kind of Google formats, key all markup language, and then uh, GeoJSON, which is a, a kind of a, a transmission language for the web when it comes to mapping data and geospatial data. And then uh, this thing here called the shape file, uh, which was created by Esri, but it's actually the, the technical description of it is open. Anybody can create shape files if they want to. A uh, quick story, it was created in 1992, and it was only intended to be around for two years. Uh, we didn't even like it. Uh, but it's like one of those things where once it gains traction, it just takes off. And here we are over 30 years later, people are still using shape files. And I could do a whole session about why you shouldn't use shape files, but, <laughs> uh, but it's here. And when you're at a government data portal and they have a shape file, grab it because that's probably the best format that you're going to find. So if I click on shape file, it's going to go ahead and, and uh, download uh, that uh, for me. Um, and what I can do then in, um, is take that uh, shape file that was created and click new item and uh, drag this over. Uh, and then what it will do, it'll take that shape file off my disk and it'll actually push it into our Esri cloud and make it available here in your little directory portal, so to speak. And now that shapefile has been turned into a web service. It now has a REST endpoint. You can bring it into a web map. And it is now kind of web uh, web ready. And if I go over here, I'll find the... Um, here is the... Um, let me see. Yeah, New York City bike routes. Uh, and then... Uh, and that's the uploaded shapefile. But then it turned it into this thing called a feature layer. And that's a web service. So if I click into this thing, I get a kind of an item page for that layer, that layer of information in the map of the bike lanes. And uh, I can, you know, learn more about the data. I can, uh, you know, set its default visualization. I can create hit settings in order to decide whether this thing's going to be editable or not, or who can edit it, or what can be edited of it. So you really have full control over this web service and what folks can do with it. Uh, well, you know, a simple thing I may want to do is just open it up in a map viewer, just take a look at it. And uh, that's the, and if I click on open a map viewer, that's, uh, that's what it would look like. For you developers, if you scroll all the way down, there's a box here called URL. And if I copy that uh, to the clipboard, uh, what you'll find is it gives you a URL or what we call a, a web service REST endpoint. So if I come into, if I go into the map, I can add uh, the layer from a URL and paste that URL in there. Or what I can do when I'm back here is just click open in the map viewer and it'll fire up a brand new map viewer and put that bike lane layer in there. Uh, you can see where all the bike lanes are in the city. And if I click on one, it get, gives me a neat little pop-up that gives me attributes for that feature. Uh, for those of you who work with GIS, you know, I'll, I'll start speeding up soon because this is probably pretty basic for you. Uh, but you know, uh, now that you have this New York City open data in your map, we can start exploring it. Like I said, you click on things. You can pan and zoom around. You can uh, turn on other layers, for example... This gray layer is good because it makes things pop up. But one of my favorite uh, base maps to put underneath your layer is the open street map layer because it's got a lot of details on it. But you could put satellite photography under this. You could put our a community map base map under this. Uh, there's lots of different base maps. I could do imagery hybrid where we've got imagery and also labels. Well, let's just go ahead and hit leave the light gray canvas on there so that everything kind of pops out from it. Uh, and start exploring it. Well, when it comes to the spatial analysis, the first step for me of spatial analysis is panning and zooming and clicking on things and comparing it to other things that are on the base map and comparing it visually with other layers that you may have in your map. Uh, the next step that I think of when I'm doing spatial analysis is to, uh, right now you see all the bike lanes are just thin red lines. So that's not really informative. We can make this more informative. 
because it, you may have noticed when I clicked on one of these layers, uh, one of the attributes here is called the uh, facility class or the all classes. And the facility class says, hey, what class of bike lane is this? There's one, two, and three. Class three bike lane is like um, a, a, a share road bike, bike lane where you're kind of sharing the road with the other uh, other vehicles. Uh, class two is, uh, no, class one is something where it's just a completely uh, separate bike lane and it's protected from the rest of traffic. Uh, class two is somewhere in between. I can't remember right now. But wouldn't it be neat if we can kind of symbolize this map so that you can see at a glance what uh what what's uh, how this is classified so i'm going to turn that layer off and turn that one on and the way i did it was um i could go into properties and edit the layer style and again this is all recorded oh and by the by the way um everything that i'm doing here at the end of this presentation i'm going to have a link to a video that i created that has all of these steps in detail and also a document that goes into these steps in detail. So you don't have to feel like you have to write everything down. So if I uh, click, if I say, Hey, I want to symbolize this on the facility class field and then um, go and then symbolize it with some type of unique color so that each different facility class has a different color. And if I do that, it ends up looking something like this. Now this is a more useful map. Uh, and, and kind of my second step into spatial analysis is to say, all right, well, the, um, the green ones are the really good ones. That's class one. That's really protected. You know, if you're on a green, uh, line, there's a probably a lot safer. Whereas blue, blue is class two and then red bike lanes. They are still bike lanes, but they're shared with the rest of the vehicles. So that's just kind of a neat a uh, way to kind of explore your data and make a, a map that's more useful, not only for yourself, but also for whoever you're sharing with, or if you drop it into a story map and tell a story around it, then you're off and running uh, in that respect. All right. So there's bike lanes. Now I want to start doing more analysis. I want to compare, I want to, uh, I want to ask myself, well, why do we have bike lanes anyway? Well, we're trying to decrease traffic. We're trying to increase safety we're trying to encourage folks in the city to use bikes it's better maybe it's better for your health or maybe it's better for the environment uh and it maybe the 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 tolls don't cost as much you know whatever um and and in a city in a city like ours it's it's kind of convenient but um another type of information i can get out of the open data site is information about uh motor vehicle collisions and I want to see how well are these bike lanes doing? And do we have bike lanes? Are the bike lanes that are there the, of the right class? Or do we have lots of incidents that don't have bike lanes where maybe we should build bike lanes? So if I click on the motor vehicle collisions cl crashes and explore the data that's inside of it, you'll find that two pieces of information here. Well, we have... Um, it motor vehicle crashes, how many motorists were injured, how many pedestrians were injured, how many people were injured, how many cyclists were injured. So I can subset this, I can download this data, but I don't need all of it. I really just want the cyclist information and I want to map that cyclist injury, motor vehicle incident information and compare it to the bike lanes. So if I download that information, normally. There we go. So the ribbon, the zoom ribbon at the top of the screen keeps getting in the way. Uh, so, okay. So where am I going here? Um, right. So I can download that data set. And then when I, let's just kind of jump ahead here. And much in the same way that I did it before. Um, what I can do is I can export into, and in this case, it's giving me the option for, for downloading in CSV or, or XML. And if I can take it all, I'll take it in CSV. Yeah, that's fine. 
And then um, the other uh, part is that, in fact, you probably find this real handy, particularly when you're working with 311 data, is you never want to download the whole data set. You really just want to download those records and those columns that you want. So you can use a where clause, you know, select clause and a where clause, you know, just kind of equate that with SQL. And the open data site uh, gives you a really neat way to kind of build your own query so that you only get the stuff that you want. So what I wanted is I only want the bicycle related columns and I really just kind of want data from say 2020 and afterwards, say during COVID time and beyond. And if I bring that in, let's see here. I have that here. Uh, I brought in the CSV file called uh, Motor Vehicle Collisions Bikes from 2020 and then created a feature layer uh, from that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's go back to my map here. Boss, my map. Yeah, here it is. Okay, and then uh, let me see. Get rid of that. All right, so um, here is. Um, ah, here we go. So here are all the motor vehicle collisions that involved bicycles uh, since 2020. That's a lot. Um, and and not only is that a lot, but you'll find with a lot of public safety data. Here's a tip. You'll find that a lot, a lot of the incidents are snapped to intersections. They're not put exactly where the collision is. I think there's some type of kind of anonymity type stuff that's in there. So you'll see the, the incidents aren't just occurring at intersections. They're just kind of snapped to the closest intersection. But when it comes to um, comparing this incident data with uh, bike lanes, that's, that's really good enough. Uh, so I can start exploring this stuff. And the other thing you'll find is sometimes you'll have points on tops of, of points on tops of points. And you can't just tell by looking at it whether it's one point or whether it's more. But if I click on it, I can get more information up on it. So one of the, the visualization tools that we have in here for spatial analysis of this kind of data is called a heat map. So if I turn these dots off and instead I symbolize it as a heat map, it starts to make more sense. And even before I start doing statistical calculations, you can really start drawing some inferences, even intuitively, just using your eyes, that we've got a, a lot of incidents here, even though there is some uh, class one bike lane, probably because there's a lot of traffic coming in here off of, uh, off of this, at the bottom of the Williamsburg bridge at the end of it, there's a lot because probably there's a lot of bike riders there. But then there's there's areas that have a lot of motor vehicle related bike injuries where there uh, is no bike lane at all, not even a class three lane. So if you're trying to make a case, say in a com community board meeting about why isn't New York City DOT, when are they going to get to bike lanes for us? Uh, you can use data like this, even if you don't run the statistics, just eyeballing it, you can see areas that pop right out. Um, like I used to, I used to go up here to Bronx Community College, and there was a, here's one where you know we got a lot of students, and we have other schools in the area, and here is a class three bike lane that maybe screams for being a class one bike lane. So that's you know some type of inferences that you can that you can use, um, and you'll also find if you look at New York City DOT's uh, projects that the projects that DOT has for creating and increasing bike lanes doesn't always correspond to where the incidents are. I think DOT seems to be on this mission of um, creating a network and connecting bike paths together in order to make the entire city more navigable, which is great. But at least, at least um, you don't have to guess. When you start bringing New York City open data down, you start looking at it, you start analyzing it, you don't have to guess as much anymore. You can start making real inferences off of real data. All right. And then uh, another thing I can do here is, uh, let's go ahead and turn this off, is um, I can create buffers. Let me see if I can turn this off. 
what I did was, um, of the bike lanes, there is spatial analysis tools over here on the right. So if I go to the bike lanes and uh, click analysis, you'll see that we open up and these run on the cloud and you can run uh, these analytical tools in order to do a wide variety of, of things uh, right here on, on the Esri cloud. And let me kind of t tell you what I mean by that is um, here are kind of the 26 different types of spatial analysis that we at Esri talk about and design our tools and systems around. Uh, understanding where, straight away. I think that's real intuitive for everyone. Then measuring size, shape, and distribution. I'm doing a little bit of that. Determining how places are related. So we're relating motor vehicle crashes with bike lanes and how they coincide, how they don't coincide. Uh, finding the best locations and paths, detecting the quantified patterns, and then going forward, not only understanding what happened in the past, but using spatial analysis tools in order to help model and predict what's going on in the future. And a lot of these tools, uh, if you use our kind of our heavy duty workstation products, they can do those in a real heavy duty way. But even on even on uh, on our on our cloud RGS online, there are a lot of these types of tools of analyzing patterns, uh, managing data, analyzing the terrain. There's a lot of stuff you can do. In this case, I'm going to use proximity, and there's a tool here called Create Buffers. And what I'm going to do with the bike lane is I'm going to create. Let me turn this off. I'm going to create five meter buffers around all the bike lanes and then take a look at those motor vehicle collisions again uh, and start to do some statistical summary of how many of these uh, incidents were inside the bike lane versus outside of the bike lane and really start to generate some statistics here. I always have problems with that word. So take the <laughs> statistics. Um, in fact, I symbolize them similarly. So we have the green is the class one, the blue is the class two, and the red is class three. I just chose to uh, to kind of to symbolize those the same in order for the map uh, to make to make a lot more sense. Uh, so that is that. And uh, let me see. We can probably skip ahead here. Oh yeah. So um, from from that buffer, then what I can do is. Um, is select is to select those incident points that are within or outside of the um the buffers and these are all the incidents that were inside the class one lanes so this is a lot of motor vehicle accidents that involve bicycles that are inside of class one bike lanes uh then class two bike lanes and, and finally class three bike lanes. Uh, and then, let's see. Oh, and not finally. And then here are all the incidents that occurred outside of bike lanes. So now I can start running some statistical tools, whichever ones you want uh, on those because, um, yeah, and and these are the tools here. I, I wish I had more time to go into them all, but that's, that's kind of... Uh, you know, not only the tools for getting the open data, bringing it in, symbolizing it, starting to learn more by looking at it based on attribute symbology, but also then leveraging uh, these here, uh, these tools. Oh, you know what? Let me show you another tool I thought was kind of neat was. Um... No, it's the aggregate. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, we have this um, data um, aggregation tool. So if I click on this, there is a tool over here called uh, aggregation. And it helps you when you have lots and lots of data, particularly 311 data, because there's lots of it. And you can uh, kind of use clustering and binning in order to make uh, have it make a bit more sense. So if I turn this on, you'll see... Um, here are uh, here's a just a different way to kind of visualize those incidents, and if I zoom in, I can even make it so that I can turn on 
the numbers that are associated with each one of these bins, uh, or I can cluster them as well. So just interesting ways to kind of visualize and and manage uh, that data in order to learn more from it. All right, so that's that. Next. All right, so, and then there's even more advanced stuff that you can do. Um, I'm not talking too much about this stuff because it's not available in the lightweight online version. But if you have access to ArcGIS at your office, just know that our advancement is going forward. We're doing a lot with embedding AI in order to automate data collection um, and uh, you know doing analytics not only in 2D, but also 3D uh, um, analysis um, as well. And let me see, I skipped through that. Oh, okay. And so uh, the next thing I wanted to do here okay so let me see here okay so uh the next is with um uh using our python api along with the analytical tools that are within our gis but also python being a very powerful way for you to bring in also other packages as well so if you're an R programmer, you're using uh, NumPy or SciPy or d using uh, or, or, uh, Pandas or whatever uh, packages that you're using to manipulate data, that ArcGIS doesn't replace any of that. It just supplements uh, of what you're doing with a lot more um, ability to, to, uh, to bring the power of GIS uh, into it. Uh, in that previous presentation, Martha was showing that there are some mapping tools, uh, mapping libraries out there. Well, we have one as well. So this map component that you see inside of the Jupyter Notebook is actually an ArcGIS web map. So ArcGIS web maps are also a way uh, that you can kind of bring that into, into your Jupyter Notebook and uh, do your analysis uh, I mean, multiple steps that way. We have a Python API and uh, these days, it's been around for a while. Um, and these days, you'll find, at least I'm finding, that there, there really isn't, when it comes to GIS and Python, there really isn't much you need to write from scratch anymore. There's just so much out there. We have hundreds of examples. The community online shares Python scripts and notebooks all the time. So for me, it's mostly a matter of, in fact, that's the one thing I had to break out. I don't know if you're like me with Python. When you see a problem, you start to think about, oh, okay, how am I going to write that script to solve that problem? And I just had to smack my hand so many times because there's usually a package out there that does it already or a sample script in the community where someone already did it. So if you're having a problem, someone else has probably already had that problem and have probably solved it. So it's either a matter of finding something that just works as is or finding something that works close and tweaking it to fit you or cobbling a few things together. Uh, that's, you know, when people ask me about Python, I mean, for me, I, I'm, I, I, I think I'm like a yellow belt Python person, not blind belt, kind of a yellow belt, right? I know the basics. I know, you know, looping in variables and lists and conditions and things like that. And what I found is you just need the basics to be able to take someone else's script and be able to read it and understand what's going on in there. So don't feel like, well, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm never, I tried to learn, I'm not going to get good at it. I don't, at least my experience, I've found if, if you got a good grasp on, on just a few days of learning the basics, you're probably 80% of the way there. Uh, but if you are a data scientist and you need all that whiz bang stuff, that's, it's powerful and it's all there. So we have a lot of these sample notebooks analyzing violent crime, um, finding grazing allotments, very Handy for New York City Open Data. Uh, safe streets to schools, finding a new home. Uh, there was one here um, that uses um, New York City Open Data. Uh, the TLC, Taxi Limousine Commission, they load a lot of data on the Open Data site and analyzing New York City taxi data using big data tools. And we've got a notebook in here that not only gives you all the code, but describes step-by-step step how this works. And it's not just using ArcGIS stuff. Here's, there's a, a Pandas data frame in here. Very popular uh, tool if you're using Python, Pandas, 
and the data frames come in real handy. Um, let me see. There was another one here that I found that I wanted to show you. Is oh, um, analyzing the factors of growth and spatial distribution of Airbnb properties across New York City. All right, maybe not so useful anymore after was a local law eighteen. Look, have you heard of that? I guess New York's trying to crush, push Airbnb back into New Jersey. But if you want to analyze what's going on, um, there is data that's out there and you can learn a lot just by, I think I learn best on when it comes to coding, I'll learn best from samples and I learn from manuals. Is anyone else the same? You learn best from samples. So there's lots and lots of samples here, safe streets to schools, a lot of uh, Corona uh, uh, stuff in here. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing good. Um, you know, impervious surfaces. So there's lots of stuff in here. Uh, samples that you can use. What else did I have here for you? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so uh, when you sign up for that developer subscription, you also get access to the Python API. So, uh, and we have lots of tutorials in there for getting going with it, and then from the samples, uh, you're off and running uh, from from there. Uh, okay. Did you say there's one for R2 or no? Oh, if, if you program in R, well, there is, then, and there's a Python package for interfacing with R, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so what you would do in your Python script, in your notebook or whatever, just import ArcGIS and then import whatever other packages, pandas, NumPy, whatever, you know, statistical packages that you're used to using, and you can pass data back and forth amongst them. Let ArcGIS do what ArcGIS is good at and let everything else do what everything else is good at. So, yeah. And then, um, let me see. Yeah, and um, we have a 24-7, 365 online Q&A site. It's like a, a Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow uh, for Esri's global community for doing spatial data science, for using the Python API. If you have a question, you're running into a snag, chances are someone else has already hit that first and they've asked it and it's been answered and the best answers have been bubbled uh, to the top. If you can't find your question, then go ahead and ask it. And I don't know where these people get their time from, but they love going out there and answering questions. So use the community. Everyone likes to show off how smart they are and do it because I get the benefit from that. And then uh, I think there was one where you have two accounts. If you ask your question, no one answers, then you answer your own question, kind of smug, but wrong. And then the rest of the community <laughs> will like seize on that. So they might not have answered you, but you know they want to tell that guy that he was wrong, right? So that's uh, Cunningham's Law or something like that. Anyways, we have lots of video, thousands of video out there uh, just find one that hits that niche uh for you uh out on out on media space if you're new to ArcGIS, then what i recommend is do what the hackathon people do like i've in the past have supported hackathons in the past has anyone been involved with a hackathon when you're solving a problem with the hackathon are you in the mood to learn something new no you're probably just going to i don't have my glass slide to show me oh 10 minutes, oh, 10 minutes. um you're really not in the mood to learn something new. You just want to kind of use the tools you want to use. But if you really want to use ArcGIS, what we did is we created this 30-minute video so that you can learn enough to be dangerous in a hackathon. Uh, and uh, and if you're trying to learn something fast, uh, this is a good way to go. Um, get that developer account. Search, find, import, create, host, match data in the cloud. Make style and share web map. Use API keys. Story maps, uh, our REST, our APIs. Um, if you are a web developer, we do have a JavaScript API, but we also have app builders that you can build pretty customized web applications and wrap those around your web maps without any code. But if you are a developer, we have JavaScript API. If you're a Mapbox developer or Esri or Leaflet, Open Layers, Cesium. If you don't have to use our JavaScript API, you can use whatever client-side API you're comfortable with. We have a small, thin, little JavaScript library called REST.js 
basically a thin JavaScript wrapper around our REST API. So that while you're using Mapbox or, or Leaflet, you can still bring ArcGIS based services uh, in. Oh yeah, I remember the one thing I wanted to show is not only, um, we also have this uh, site that you get access to um, when you sign up for that developer subscription is this thing called Living Atlas of the World. Now I know this event is about New York City Open Data. Absolutely, that's where the meat of it is. That's where the knowledge is. But here are thousands, it's probably hundreds of thousands of map layers. And a lot, and if I just search on, uh, say, New York City, you'll find stuff in here as well that you can use perhaps to supplement the data that you're bringing in from the open data site. Because not, uh, not all the mapping layers that are relevant to New York come from New York City agencies. There's weather services, there's New York State sources, there's federal sources, there's world sources of information that you can uh, bring into your maps and use along with it. You also have um, uh, with with you also have uh, you could bring in a you know a live weather service, a live traffic service, and use that to supplement uh, the the New York City open data that you're bringing in. So no, it's not just about the open data. We also and our community community of users share this information and we curate that for you. Uh, so that you can um, bring that in and make really good maps, make really good decisions based on the most um, uh, latest information uh, that that that's out there. Uh, let me see. Okay, one more thing I want to show them, and then we'll open it up to questions. Is um, and I just got this idea from the last presentation. Martha did a presentation, and I said, "Oh, I want to kind of spin off of that." So I'm going to do something that I never do. I'm in a presentation. I'm going to do something for the first time that I that I didn't write or rehearse before before. Um, and um, and yeah, you know, wish me luck. Oh, you know what? I actually left it up here. Okay, so um, let me start. Um, okay, now you don't yet. Yeah, this is not a product that's out yet, but I know. Folks like you, tech people like you, you like to see what's coming so that you could kind of plan ahead. We have this cool new product called, and it works in the browser on SaaS called Data Pipelines. And if I create a data pipeline, and let's say um, I search for data uh, bike parking locations, uh, and instead of downloading a sheet file, uh, Martha showed that you've got this, um, this developer REST endpoint here. So instead of downloading a shape file, I'm going to take this JSON file and I'm going to plug it in here. It's actually a GeoJSON file. Let me change that. So this is a GeoJSON file that is sitting somewhere on New York City Open Data site. All right. So because before when I was downloading that data and republishing it, I was actually disconnecting it from the source. So now it's just a static copy. If that data back in New York changes, I, I now have to go back and get it. So here is that JSON file. I didn't copy it local. It's still sitting over there. Uh, then the next thing I want to do, that's my input. I want my tool to be, I'm going to filter uh, by attribute. And um, uh, I want to connect the bike parking locations to the attribute. Let me see. My geometry type is a point. And then I want to filter uh, by attribute. I'm going to build a new query that says, you know what? I just want, I don't want all the bike parking locations. I just want the um, borough name is Brooklyn. Oh, I should have done Queens. because, Anyways. And then, the th and so that's my input. That's my tool. And here's my output. My output's going to be a feature layer. And if I drag that over there and I name this thing, uh, Brooklyn bike parking. Uh, I can uh, preview what that's going to look like. And it goes out, it gets it, it brings it in, it filters it by Brooklyn. And then if I run it, it uh, creates a brand new feature layer uh, on ArcGIS. And yes, at that point, it, oh, okay, I did it here. This is, I did it with Manhattan. 
Um, and and so uh, now I have this layer that's in this map. So if I share this map with someone, they're always going to have the newest bike parking. I don't have to update that data. It's going to update it for me. And how does it do that? It does it because um, when I save this thing, let me see. I have lots of stuff that's called ASDF. Uh, there's a schedule here, and I can create a task that says update this once a month automatically or, or overnight or on demand or once an hour or once a year. I can set this up, and I, and I, don't ha I can fire and forget. That map that I shared with someone, that app that I sent out, when you open that up, you know you have the latest bar bike parking locations because um, once a week or once a day or once a year, once whatever you set it, it's going to automatically update that. Now, you could have done this all along with a Python script and put it into like a task manager. You could have done it that way, but this is just a neat, without writing any lines of code, you can create yourself a, a pipeline. And that pipeline on an interval that you choose goes out and it's constantly refreshing your data off of whatever the latest is on the New York City Open Data site. Tim? That's sweet. Back to you. <laughs> what I mean. If anybody has questions or wants to keep, or ask something, um, I'm curious to see how you see ArcGIS coexisting with or competed with, with generative AI. I mean, I, I am now in the business of, of writing natural language prompts for code. And it's just like, I can, it's easier than doing that point and click because, you know, some, you know, how is this, you know, otherwise I would be using RTS, but now I'm just, you know, writing my own, generating my own. Right. So I don't know if I can give it a really well thought answer. I can't say. So my role, can, you know, Jim's solution, uh, a, a solution engineer who solves problems all the time. I'm just a project manager. I run projects. We're working on a project in Miami to help, um, Take the data that is that they've loaded. There's geospatial data that's in their hub, and any answer of your questions. And so, kind of thinking about how the GIS, without having an interface, just answers weird questions quite accurately. Right. So, basing it on the available data in in their example about um, uh, extreme heat. I'm not sure that. Yeah, we're I wasn't satisfied. We're, right. we're working with it, not competing against it. Uh, so as as technology advances, we're all our, we have R and D centers all over the world that are figuring out does GIS have a play in here in a complementary way? And uh, there was a conference we just did last month in DC where we did a presentation where we have our uh, our Washington DC R and D centers working on merging them so that. Um, GIS data can be indexed in such a way. In fact, this demo that they showed was kind of neat where they're um, downloading data and creating maps and symbolizing maps just using natural language and using large language models and natural language processing in order to, to make a more human natural interface with mapping tools, not only for creating maps, but for also for analyzing them. So I see them working to get together. Then. Yes. Um, you guys have probably have perspective outside the five boroughs. Where do you see other jurisdictions using open data aggressively? Where we can see use cases and maybe learn something and bring it to New York? Uh, city, city and county of LA are real good at it. Okay. Um, Philly is real good at it. Um, any other? No, I don't know. You know, it's working. You mentioned that because there's stuff that the county of LA does that I feel like just steal for us, right? They make their. Uh, their locators, their entire locator files available, for example, so that you can download that in. Chicago's not as good. New York size, I would say County of LA is probably the best example of a city open day. Still, in my, I mean, New York is doing the best out of any city. I was in Toronto recently, and they're looking to New York for how they're over. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah.